new proclamations. What wise men, great men, medical men, professional people have not been able to do, God will do it. All those things that are forgotten, your forgotten strength, your forgotten power, your forgotten revelation, everything you said, I had a dream long ago. And I thought, this is what I will do. I've forgotten now, your forgotten vision will come up again. Passion will come up again. Revelation will come up again. New life will come up again in your life in Jesus' name. Only Christ Jesus has the power of this new year. An unforgettable encounter beckons. We are connecting to the God of wonders this new year for salvation and deliverance. Welcome GCK to Asaba. Delta State, Nigeria, January 26th to 31st, 2023. 1600 hours GMT daily and Global Sunday Worship at or 700 hours GMT. Also featuring ministers and professionals conference with Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Young Professionals. It's a new year of wonders this 2023. From the Niger Delta, the oil of anointing will be transported by satellite and all our social media links to over 150 countries of the world. Join the team in GCK audience as the man appointed by God, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W.F. Komoi, connects the world to an unforgettable encounter with the God of Wonders. Glorious music ministrations by choirs from nations across the world with guest music ministration by Jonathan Lee. Darkness gone. Yeah. Premature death cancelled. Yeah. Yours is now to reap the benefit. GCK, the, the gospel, gospel to every creature. Let us pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we bless your name for bringing us together here again today. We thank you because as we come to eat of spiritual food from the Lord's table, we know that you are going to fill us and feed us until we're satisfied in Jesus' name. We know it is this spiritual food, the bread of life, we're able to get our strength, our power, and we're able to get all the things we need to make us active and alive powerful and strong, to do everything we need to do for the glory of your name and your kingdom. We pray today that as we feed on your word, we will not reject anything from the word in Jesus' name. We pray that you will make us channels of blessings to other people, that the strength, the grace, the light we receive from you now as we fellowship together around the world will be a benefit to other people to edify the church, to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, I pray. We're still studying from this rich epistle of the Apostle Paul to the Colossians. We've gone through chapter 1. We've started chapter 2. And today we're looking at the result of union with Christ. When we come into union with Christ, there are results we get. There are things that happen in our lives. And here Paul the Apostle reveals to us by the inspiration and revelation of the Spirit of God that our union with Christ produces results. Let me remind you from Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. For I would that ye know what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. I want to remind you that these are the people that we have called out of sight saints, of faraway saints. That is, they were not at the same location where Paul the Apostle was writing or ministering, and yet he had a great concern for them. Now, this great concern he had for them was because of his love for the church. His love for the church was because of his love for Christ. You see, you love Christ because he first loved you. You love God because he first loved you. Then if you love God, you are going to love the body of Christ. You are going to love the people of God. 
you are going to love the church of the living God. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. 1 John 5, verses 1 and 2. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Here you will see that our love does not terminate with loving God alone, loving Christ alone. He that loveth God, or he that loveth Christ, also will love the people that are begotten of Christ, begotten of God. We love the people of God. We love the children of God. We love the church. And Paul the Apostle loved Christ so much. And then he revealed that in loving the church so much. He said, we're told in verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandment. You see, they all go together. Loving God, loving his children. Loving Christ, loving the body of Christ. On the other hand, loving the children of God, and loving God and keeping the commandments of God. And Paul revealed that he loved the children of God. He loved the church. But then, we need to understand that his love was not a passive thing. He had an active love. He had a practical love for the church and also for the creatures that Christ died for. Some ministers of the gospel seem so passive, without any care or concern for the local church. We can say it this way, their service is a labor of convenience. When it is convenient, when it is not difficult, when it requires no sacrifice, when it places no burden on them, when it is not going to demand from them something that they really need, then they can express some kind of passive, inactive love. But Paul the Apostle had great heaviness and sorrow of heart. Why? His love expressed itself that way for the unsaved religious people around him. His love expressed itself with a burning concern for the weak, troubled churches. Not only that, he even had labor pains and travail for confused, backsliding church members. He had fear on behalf of unstable souls, and he had loving care, loving concern for the many churches under his leadership. And this is what he expressed in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, by saying, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you. The Greek word for conflict there also means agony, also means travail of heart, also means heaviness in the spirit. He was saying, you need to know. Colossian brethren, what great conflict, what great agony, what, guest, what great stirring of heart, what great burden, what great concern, what great travail and pains I have on your behalf. And it wasn't only for the church at Colossae alone. Turn with me to Romans chapter 9, verse 2. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ. For my brethren, the, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Here he had a great burden, heaviness in the heart, continual sorrow in the heart, for the religious people of Israel that were not saved. That's because he loved them. He thought about them. If you don't think about people, you are not going to have any burden for them. Not only that, he had a burning concern. For the people that are weak, for the people that are troubled, for the people that are perplexed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29, he asked this question, he said, Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I born not? That is, he identified with the people. They suffered, he suffered for them. They had pain, he had pains on their behalf. They were weak, he felt the weakness. They burnt and eat you. He had burning within. That is, when they were offended, when they were injured, he felt for them. Here is the love of a real true minister of the gospel. He had labor pains on the part of the Galatian believers. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. My little children, 
of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. These believers were getting confused. These believers were becoming backsliding because of the erroneous teachings that were coming to the province of Galatia. And he said, I'm concerned, I love, I care, I am burdened, I have pain, labor pains and travail, wanting Christ to be formed in you again. That was love. Consuming love, it was. He had also fear on behalf of, of unstable souls. Look at it from verse 9 of this same Galatians chapter 4. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, he said the same thing again. 2 Corinthians 7, 5. For when we come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without our fightings, within our fears. What he meant is that he was fighting false prophets, he was fighting Judaizers, he was fighting all the people that is fighting with the word of God, defending the faith, fighting the good fight of faith with those outsiders. Then he said, within our fears, even within the churches, he said he had his travails, he had his pains, he had his fears, he had the things that was giving him real concern. Then he said, nevertheless, but say, God that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, or by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind towards me, so that I rejoiced the more. When he saw that these people became stable, dependable, trustworthy, then he said, I rejoice. All the concern, all the fears I had before, all those things vanished away. That was love. He had loving concern, loving care for the many churches under his leadership. Let's turn back to Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So then you can understand the mind or the heart of Paul the Apostle. He had love for the churches, not passive love, in active love, unconcerned love, uncaring love, but he had a, a kind of love that made him to pray out of a burning heart, out of continual sorrow in the heart. He had a kind of love that made him to, be, to get so concerned with burning concern that he had to visit the troubled and weak churches. He had labor pains that sent him upon his knees Traveling and praying that Christ will come in all his fullness of glory and grace into the hearts and lives of the Galatians once again. He had fear that these people that he had won to the Lord might just backslide and become apostates and be lost forever eventually. Therefore, he was fearful or he, was, uh, he had this concern within, troubling his heart for the, un for the unstable soul. And he had this loving concern, loving care, and loving visitation for the many churches under its leadership. That's a challenge for you and for me. That if we are ministers of the gospel over a group of people, house fellowship or in the area or in the zone, or maybe in the whole district or a, a greater kind of, uh, a, a greater kind of uh, territory that you cover, then we have to have real love, practical love, active love that issues in concern and in prayer for the people of God. Because this is Paul's example. It is a real pattern for all of us that believe in the Lord. Now Paul's love, I told you, was first for Christ, then for the church. That led him to write, to pray for them, to preach to them, to comfort them, to strengthen them, to teach and counsel the churches. In this epistle, he ministered to the faraway saints at Colossae, to comfort and to strengthen their hearts. Now, in the verses we're looking at today, verses 3 through to 7, he reassures the heart of the believers. 
One, on the fullness of Christ. The completeness of Christ. Two, on fellowship with Christ and with Christians. And three, on steadfast faith in Christ. Let's look at the passage, Colossians chapter 2. From verse 3 all through to verse 7. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man shall beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joined and beholding your order, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. There are three points we're going to look at in the passage I read to you. Number one, the fullness of Christ. Number two, fellowship through Christ. Three, steadfastness in Christ. Let's go to point one, the fullness of Christ. And here is something very important for you and for me. It was important for the Colossians those days. Why? Because Paul's teachers had come to Colossae and they were attacking the deity and the sufficiency of Christ. Look at verse 4. And this I say, this I say. What does that mean? Verse 3. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That statement of verse 3, I impress upon you, I throw at you, I give it to you, and I want you to meditate upon it because I say it, lest any man shall beguile you with enticing words, with empty words, with confusing words. You see these teachers at Colossae, they were attacking the deity of Christ, the sufficiency of Christ, the fullness of Christ, the completeness of Christ. But now the believers were reassured that all we need is in Christ. He is sufficient, he is complete, and he is full. You see, there are still uh, people today, they may be Judaizers, and they want to bring the people of God back to, the Juda back to Judaism. And they are saying that, Christ is not complete. It's not enough to give us salvation, to give us redemption, to bring us in reconciliation to God that we must add some other things. There are also ritualistic people today who will tell us the blood of Jesus Christ is not sufficient. They will tell us that the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary is not sufficient. We need to add some holy water, some candles, some incense, some rolling on the ground, and some other kinds of ceremonies and rituals. There are other people today that carry back about Jehovah's Witnesses, and they tell us that Christ is not the God that he is, that he is not God of very God, is not God incarnate. They will tell you that he is not eternal at all, that he was created. They will tell you he was probably one of the angels. But here, Paul the Apostle says, in Christ are he. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that if anyone will come to confuse you today and tell you that Christ is not God, that Christ is not sufficient, that Christ is not complete, that there is no fullness in Christ, that you cannot get saved by depending upon Christ alone, that you need another religion, you need ceremony, you need another sacrifice, you need rituals, you need any other thing that you can do that they can do, that you will understand that these are deceivers. The Holy Spirit settled it in the hearts of these people. And it's still settling it in our hearts today concerning this revelation of Christ. That Christ is the treasury of true wisdom and knowledge. That he and his word are sufficient and reliable and trustworthy. Look at this uh, verse 3 again. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Some of those uh, erroneous teachers, false teachers, the heretics, they believed and they were teaching that if you wanted really to be saved, that if you wanted really to have fellowship with God, that the knowledge you need, the wisdom you need, are hidden in some special books. And there are people that still say that today, that if you really want confidence, you really want power, you really want to be sufficient within yourself, you want to overcome bad luck, you want to have real peace of heart and peace in the family, 
there is a kind of bull coming from India, a kind of bull coming from the forest, a kind of book coming from the occultic people, a kind of knowledge that is hidden from the average man, that if you only get these hidden resources, hidden books, hidden materials, only then will you be able to have self-confidence and power and peace and prosperity and whatever it is. But then Paul the Apostle said, no, those are liars, those are heretics, those are people that bring confusion, to the minds of the unweary and to the minds of uh, to the minds of the unwary and the minds of those who are simple at heart. It says in Christ, I hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Therefore, all that we need is in Christ. By studying and believing God's word, we discover all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge necessary to eternal salvation. Necessary to present salvation. Necessary to fellowship with God. Necessary to reconciliation with God. And necessary for our relationship with God. All that we need is in Christ. Look at verse 9. For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You don't have to get outside Christ. Within Christ. In Christ. In union with Christ. This is the result. All that you need of godliness, all that you need of grace, all that you need of holiness, all that you need of peace of heart, all that you need of answer to prayer, you find in Christ, for in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If somebody is deceiving you saying that there's a book somewhere, there are some materials somewhere, there are some rituals that can be taught somewhere, there are some things you have not discovered, they have not told you in the Bible, and they are hidden in some lost books that they have now found. They have found some kind of book that they say now contains the real truth that will lead you into the understanding of who God is, of what power is, of how to get to heaven. All that is a lie. In Christ are he. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Because in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In John chapter 1. Verses 15 and 16. John 1, 15 and 16. John bear witness of him and cried, saying, That this was he of whom I speak, he that cometh after me is preferred before me. For he was before me, and of his fullness have we all received grace for grace. Of his fullness have we all received if you have found anybody that has power through Christ, if you have found anybody that knows how to pray, if you have found anybody that has a change of life, if you have found anybody that has confidence in God, if you have had anybody, if you have found anybody that has hope of making heaven when he dies, if you find a person that is living a peaceful life, if you find any good thing in anyone within the church, don't think maybe they got it through some hidden power, hidden books, hidden materials, hidden rituals, something they have not made known to us. No, John tells us very clearly of his fullness. Have we all received grace for grace? Whether it is abundant grace or grace that makes us to reign in life over every circumstance of life, it is out of the fullness of Christ we receive everything. Colossians chapter 1 from verse 17. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17 and verse 19. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him shall all fullness dwell. Don't go outside Christ. Don't let anybody deceive you running after the shadow, after the mirage of life, because it has pleased the Father that in Christ shall all fullness dwell. Everything you need, everything you really want, now and for eternity, you will find in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And has put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Christ is sufficient. Christ 
is complete. And therefore, Paul the Apostle assured these people of the fullness and the completeness and the sufficiency and the deity of Christ. Now, this leads us to point two. That is, fellowship through Christ. Now, the false preachers that came to Colossae were teaching the people that if they really wanted fellowship with God, fellowship with the Almighty, and they used some big terms and they used some terms that you will think they are the truth if you want to have fellowship with the unseen reality. And other things that they used, or other names they called the Almighty God. Then they told them, if you really want that fellowship, you need to go through some angels and they have discovered their names. You need to go through some rituals and they will teach you and you go through some initiation. And you need to go through some emanating spirits as they called them. But Paul the Apostle said, nothing like that. You see, you know something? Paul's doctrine concerning Christ breaks our fellowship with God. If you think of Christ less than who Christ is, that disturbs the heart of God, that offends the heart of God, and it disturbs your fellowship with God. If you think of Christ less than Christ really is, it will break and disturb your fellowship even with true believers. You see, the false teachers were promising closer relationship and fellowship with God through a system of beliefs and worship. But in reality, they, they had distorted views about Christ. And they were going to exclude the brethren from true fellowship. And therefore, Paul the Apostle said, I'm bringing this knowledge of Christ to you, this deity of Christ to you, this fullness and sufficiency and completeness of Christ to you, so that you'll be able to keep in fellowship with the Lord. Because if you take the false views, erroneous teachings concerning Christ, you are going to break your fellowship with God and with true believers. Let's look at it from verse 4. Colossians chapter 2 from verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joining and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Here he was telling the Colossian believers, and he's telling us today as well, that we need to have real fellowship with God. How will that be? One, we have received Christ. I mean, Christ will receive not a partial or a half Christ, but the fullness of Christ. We receive Christ that was born of Virgin Mary. The Christ that was born at Bethlehem. The Christ that lived a sinless life. The Christ that was owned and accepted by the Father, saying, This is my only begotten Son. The Christ that gave his life for us as a sacrifice. That is the Christ we have received. And it says, As ye have received this Christ Jesus as the Lord, as the all in all, as the great one, as the great judge of heaven and earth, as the one into whose hands God has committed all judgment, as you have received him originally at the beginning. So keep on walking in him. So keep on believing in this fullness of Christ, in the totality of the completeness of Christ, in the sufficiency and the deity of Christ. So keep on walking in him. Because if you deviate to Paul's doctrine concerning Christ, that's going to hinder your fellowship with the Lord. Let's look at 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 from verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John here says, the truth we have learned, the truth we have known, the truth that has manifested unto us, that will declare unto you, and it is only when you believe that truth concerning Christ, 
It is only when you believe that truth concerning the word of God that you will have fellowship with God, with Christ, and with the people of God. Now you cannot have fellowship with truth and error at the same time. You cannot have fellowship with God and the devil at the same time. You cannot have fellowship with Christ and Antichrist at the same time. You cannot fe have fellowship with the people of God and the Judaizers and the erroneous people at the same time. You know, there are many people who don't realize that. They come to the church here and then they say, well, I'm in fellowship also with a particular kind of body. We study another book. I come over here to deeper life. We study the Bible and that is good. And, uh, you know, but I go to another place because, you know, everything is not in the Bible. There is a kind of hidden knowledge that uh, the people are uh, not uh, showing us. And I go to other places so that I can learn that kind of hidden knowledge. In that way, I'll be able to have a deep, great relationship with God. No, it will cut you away from the Lord. Because you cannot have fellowship with God and the devil at the same time. With Christ and the Antichrist at the same time. With the people of God and the false prophets at the same time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. From verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devil and not to God. And I would know that ye have fellowship with the devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. You cannot be here and there at the same time. You have to be somewhere. You have to be definite where you belong and where you are having fellowship. And you can only have fellowship on the basis of the truth. The truth revealed concerning Christ. The truth revealed concerning his incarnation, his death, his burial, his resurrection. The truth revealed concerning salvation that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ alone. The sanctification, the holiness, the power of the Holy Ghost that comes through Jesus Christ alone. The hope, the life eternal that comes through Jesus Christ alone. Only on the basis of that truth can you have fellowship with the Almighty God. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, reading from verse 42. Acts, chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Can you see relationship, doctrine, and fellowship? Well then, that means if you don't have the Apostles' doctrine concerning Christ as Lord, the apostles' doctrine concerning Christ as Savior. The apostles' doctrine concerning Christ as the one that died and was buried and rose again. The apostles' doctrine concerning all the revelation of the word of God. How can you be in fellowship with God? You see, fellowship with God, fellowship with Christ, depends upon living in the truth, walking in the truth, abiding in the truth. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. So, let us remember that if we're really going to keep in fellowship, we need to remain in the sound teaching of the Word of God, especially this sound teaching concerning Christ. In Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Let's look at it, what we saw before, from verse 9 to verse 12. But now, after ye have known God, or rather, unknown of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? These people have been brought to the Lord by the right knowledge of Christ, by faith in Christ, through the, sacrif through the sacrifice that Jesus Christ offered himself a waste on the cross of Calvary, the new God. They were known of God to belong to God, but now Judaizers were confusing them. False prophets were confusing them. False teachers were confusing them. And Paul the Apostle said, Now, but then, you observe days, months, times, years, like the Old Testament. He said, I'm afraid of you. Let I be sold labor upon you in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Verse 17, they zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you 
that ye might affect them. What Paul was telling them is this, that if they went into the false doctrine, false doctrine of rituals and ceremonies and sacrifices, a Judaism and hidden knowledge and occultic knowledge, that they will be excluded from God, from fellowship with God and Christ. It is righteousness and true doctrine about Christ that will keep you in fellowship with God. Paul's doctrine will sever you, divide you, separate you from the Lord. In third John, the third epistle of John, verses 3 and 4. The third epistle of John, verses 3 and 4. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. And here John, who talked about love, about fellowship, about relationship, he said, there's only one thing that causes joy in my heart, that you have received the truth, and you are still walking in that truth. You are walking in that truth. In First John chapter 2, verse 6, He that says he abideth in him, abiding in Christ, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Let's come back to Colossians chapter 2. Paul the Apostle said, if they had the real faith in the heart, and they were really worshipping God from the heart, it will produce something. The union with Christ, fellowship with Christ, will produce a holy work, an upright work, a righteous work. Let's see it from verse 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet... Am I with you in the spirit? Stop there for a moment. It says, our fellowship is not dependent on physical contact. Our fellowship is not, uh, it's not, um, it's not on holding one another. You know, there are, there are places of worship. They say, how are we going to have fellowship with one another without kissing one another, holding one another, embracing one another? Oh, Paul the Apostle said, even when I'm not in that place of worship, even when I seem to be far away, though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit. And it is not the holding one another, embracing one another, kissing one another, fleshly physical contact that brings fellowship. It is abiding in the truth. Here Paul the Apostle said, he was joined and beholding their order and the steadfastness of their faith in Christ. You see, he said, the basis of fellowship is that you still have that steadfast faith in Christ. You are shaking in the truth concerning Christ. You believe and you are standing on the fact that Jesus Christ is a Savior, the only Savior. And then he said, as ye have received him, received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk ye in him. What does that mean? You walk in the truth. If you are not walking in truth, you are not walking in Christ. It means you walk in holiness of life. If you are not walking a holy walk, a righteous walk, an upright walk, you are not walking in Christ. It means to walk in love because God is love. And Christ manifested the love because he gave himself even for the people, for, for his people. And that means if we're walking in Christ, we're walking in the truth, we're walking in holiness, we're walking in love. Now that brings us to point three. And this is in verse 7. Colossians chapter 2 verse 7. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught abounding therein with thanks given. Here Paul showed his real concern and the purpose of his ministry. That the purpose of his ministry was that these people be rooted and grounded in Christ. Established in the Lord and established in the truth. You know what? If we fail to take root in the world, if we fail to be rooted and grounded and established in Christ and in the truth, we could easily be sidetracked or blown away by every wind of doctrine. And Paul the Apostle said, I don't want you to fail. I don't want you to fall. I don't want you to be blown away by every wind of doctrine all around. I want you to be rooted and built up and established in the faith. Without strong attachment to Christ, we will fall off and wither and die. Only when we are rooted in Christ are we ready to grow and edify others. Look at this. Rooted and built 
up in him. Matthew chapter 13. Verse 5 and verse 6. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth and fought with the sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. You see, it is not enough to just hear the word of God. It is not enough to just come to the Bible study. For that thing to really penetrate into you and be rooted within you and saturate all your heart and influence and affect all your actions and all your language and all your behavior and all your conduct, it must be so deep within you. How can it become like that so that you can be rooted in the truth? By prayer. You pray it in, you pray it through. That's why we always emphasize after the Bible study, and that's what I expect tonight, that you'll pray it in, you'll pray it through. You see, to be rooted in Christ and rooted in the truth is going to take more than one minute prayer, five minutes prayer. It's going to take you praying it in, praying it through. And all that you hear about Christ, you take those points about Christ one by one. You pray it in, you pray it through. Think about the sufficiency of Christ. Pray it in and pray it through. Think about the fullness of Christ. Pray it in and pray it through. Think about the completeness of Christ. Pray it in and pray it through. And think about the deity of Christ. The fact that God became man. And pray it in and pray it in and pray it in until it becomes an established truth within you. Think about the fact that if we have fellowship with God, we abide in the truth. Think about it. Meditate upon it. Pray it in. Pray it through until the truth is totally established in you. Think about the fact that all that we need we find in Christ. It is not in any other book. It is not in any ritual. It is not in any ceremony. It is not in any man, any human being. And pray it in and pray it through. And pray until you are supernaturally convinced and you are supernaturally settled that Christ is the only one that you need. That you pray on what you are learning. That in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All that you are learning. Every time you come uh, to the fellowship like this, you take the points one by one. You are not in a hurry. As you take the points one by one, you pray on those points until the prayer affects your heart, affects your life, affects your decision, affects your relationship with people. It is that that makes you to be so consecrated and committed and absolutely surrendered unto the Lord that you become rooted and grounded in the truth. In Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may comprehend with all saints, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. How is that going to happen if you don't pray it in and pray it through? How is that going to happen if you just pray a snapshot prayer and you do not take the points one by one until you are saturated with the truth? Then we're told in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Here it says in Colossians chapter 2 verse 7, rooted and built up in him. Do you know there are people that think that were built up in the Lord and in the most holy faith only by praying, only by speaking in tongues. When they have quiet time in the morning, they do more speaking in tongues than reading the Bible. When they have a quiet time in the evening, family devotion, they do more speaking in tongues than reading the Bible. When they come to the church like this and they hear the word of God, they pray or they speak in tongues more than praying with their understanding. And anywhere they go, they think, I build up myself by speaking in tongues. I build up myself by speaking in tongues. No, those are the people that easily yield to temptation. 
Those are the people that easily fall prey to Paul's doctrine. Those are the people that are wishy-washy in their understanding. Those are the people that never remember the word of God when they ought to remember. Those are the people that are not standing firm, able to contradict all the people that bring false doctrine. Those are the people that easily fall, easily fail. Now you build up yourself by committing yourself to the study of the word of God. It says in the Acts of the Apostles, I read, you, I read to you. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. That word is able to build you up. Able to build you up. Well then, if we're going to be built up, it is going to be on the basis of the word of God. You build up yourself. Oh yes, we need, we need to pray. We need to get grace from the Lord. That's why I said, you pray it in and pray through. But also, we need to be built up in the word of God. The more you know Christ, the more you are built up in him. How do you know Christ? By studying the word. The more, the more you know God, the more you are built up in him. How do you know that? By reading the word of God and studying that word of God. The more you develop your faith, the more you are built up in him. How do you get more faith? By the word of God. It's coming by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. The more you defeat the devil, the more you are built up in him. How do you defeat the devil? By the word of God. It is written. Then be rooted and be built up in him, established in the faith. Now, we don't get established in anything if we don't think about it every time, feed upon it every time, act upon it every time, be conversant with it every time. You're not going to be steadfast in the faith if you come to the Bible study or revival hour or Sunday fellowship only once in a while. You come now, you don't come another time. Now, the church is so near to you, it's just uh, over there and it's very near to your house. This is the time to be here every Monday, every Thursday, every Sunday. And to get yourself the opportunity of being at fellowship every time so that you can be established in the faith. As ye have been taught in him, taught by him. And you are walking therein, abounding therein with thanksgiving. It's when you are built up with the word of his grace that you will not be tossed to and fro by false contrary doctrines. Then you will be established as the believers and the apostles of old. And you will remain faithful to all that you have been taught, not changing doctrine and changing behavior as human beings change clothing every time. And only then will your life be a continual praise and a continual thanksgiving unto the Lord, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Go, go through from verse 3. In whom are he? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Verse 5, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joined and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your, of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Let's rise up and pray that in and pray it through. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer so that we can be rooted in the truth, established in the faith, and built up in him. Think about Christ. Meditate on the sufficiency and the deity and the completeness and the fullness of Christ. Pray about all that. And you promise the Lord that nothing will divert your attention from Christ. You'll be looking at Christ and Christ alone. Do not depend upon rituals, ceremonies, sacrifices, herbalists, whatever. Christ is all in all. And in him it dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Put your faith in Christ. Pray it in, pray through. He's the only Savior. If you have not been saved, come to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Come to the Lord and be saved. If you have not been sanctified, you find sanctification through Christ. To be baptized in the Holy Ghost, it's through Christ. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. You'll find him to be sufficient for now and for eternity.